moldless manufacturing, moldless monocoque process uh, is the topic today. A uh, little background on M. Torres. M. Torres is the leading supplier of equipment and tooling in the aerospace world. We are the largest supplier currently in the world of the machines that actually make composite parts for airplane programs, lay up the material into a shape that's going to someday fly hopefully well. Uh, M. Torres is also a really proud uh, R&D company. We take 10% of all of our profits every year and invest it back into our own R&D programs. Uh, most of that goes into evolutionary improvements on the products we already sell to market. We're trying to make them better so that people will buy more. But some of it goes into what we call revolutionary technology, where we're trying to get out in front of the industry, where we've identified a, a gap between what's coming and what's available today, and we try to fill that gap with our own uh, technology. This, what I'm going to show you today, is an example of that. Uh, we focus a lot on composite programs, uh, Boeing 787, uh, defense programs, space programs. A huge cost factor in that is the infrastructure involved in making those parts. Uh, if anybody here, has anybody had a chance to take one of the public tours of the Boeing factory where they make the new 777X wings, uh, that factory is almost as big as the UW campus and it makes one airplane wing. So there's a lot of cost that goes into this and uh, it's something that all of the OEMs are very sensitive about. Uh, what are some of the costs? Uh, the carbon fiber material itself is very expensive. Uh, there's only a few companies in the world that sell aerospace grade carbon fiber and because of the way the FAA certifies airplanes, generally there's only one per program. So Boeing buys their material from one company out of Japan called Torre. They're the only ones allowed to sell material to Boeing. Anybody that's ever played the game Monopoly knows that that generally doesn't work out for the person who's spending the money. Uh, the time decay material. The resins that go into uh, carbon fiber are a volatile organic compound. The moment you mix the ingredients together, it starts breaking down. And you have a certain amount of time in which you can use that material to make an aircraft part before the FAA says it's no good and you have to get rid of it. Uh, they go through a lot of steps to try and slow that process down, but there's always a clock running. Uh, factory facility requirements. So this is the, the steps they do to slow that down. Uh, if you've ever walked into a refrigerator the size of this room, you can imagine that it's pretty expensive to run. Uh, so those three elements all kind of go into the costs associated with the material to bring it into the building uh, for somebody to make an airplane part. All very interesting things. I'm not going to talk about any of them today on stage. If you want to have a conversation with me afterwards, I'd be happy to do that. What I am going to talk about today is the infrastructure involved in taking that material and turning it into an airplane. So some fixed costs involved with that. Uh, the largest autoclave in the world is currently in Everett, Washington. It's 21 meters in diameter and it's 110 meters long. It cost $35 million and took three years to build. And that's the first of three that's going into Everett. It's right next door to the second largest autoclave in the world, which is for the 787 program. So between Boeing and Airbus, there's this arms race as to who can build the biggest autoclave and the people that make autoclaves think this is awesome and would love for this race to keep going. Uh, autoclave operations cost. The autoclave is a pressurized, heated cooker. But you can imagine on a size like that, it's really expensive to get something up and hold it at a stable temperature at about 350 degrees and hold it at about five atmospheres and keep it like that for about seven hours. That's really expensive to do that. Uh, they're not small. So they take up a lot of factory floor space and they cost you money in your factory instead of generating money in your factory. That's just the fixed cost. Then there's the rotating cost of the molds themselves. And let me back up there, here we go. You gotta make a mold to lay your airplane part up on. Carbon fiber comes basically like masking tape. You gotta wrap it around a surface that's going to be the, usually the inner shape of what you're making. Sometimes it's the outer airfoil shape but you have to have something to press against to create that carbon fiber part. The higher and faster you set your build rate, the more copies of that mold you have to buy. Uh, little fun fact, the Charleston facility that makes the back third of the uh, 787 fuselage, they make three variants in that factory. There are 14 molds involved in one set of fuselages. Currently they have 12 sets of molds, 14, pieces per set, each piece costs over a million dollars. So that's some fun math for you on one program on one part of one airplane. Uh, there's the maintenance costs that go with it. Every time you lay up a carbon fiber part on that mold, a little bit of the resin gets left behind. 
and you that starts to distort your surface, which when your tolerances are down into uh, thinner than a piece of paper, every little bit of degradation affects your airfoil shape, which makes your plane less efficient, which makes it more expensive to run, so airlines generally don't like that. So about every five build sets, you've got to clean the entire mold surface off. Right now, that's a manual process. So if anybody's looking for research ideas, figure out how to automate the cleaning of a 110-foot long carbon fiber mold. Uh, so also, any of the systems they have tried to automate on that, that, or even the manual scrubbing with Brillo pads, that breaks the mold down. So after 100 cycles or so, you've got to replace your mold. And then there's all the systems to move those molds around your factory. They're not small pieces. So you can't just get 40 people together, lift it up on your shoulder and haul it around. They weigh tens of tons to move, so there's all of the equipment to uh, move it around. That same example I gave you about the Boeing Charleston factory, for every piece of that mold, there's a cart to drive it around the facility to a larger cart where they get assembled into something that looks like an airplane and then goes into an even larger machine that puts carbon fiber around it. So there's a lot of stuff in this building and all of it costs money. So the question Antora has asked is, can you make an airplane part that looks something like that shape but without using any of the stuff in that picture? Uh, just a fun data point, either of those pictures represents about a $25 million investment for a factory just for what's shown in the picture. Now if you make 25 copies of it so that you can meet your build rate, you start adding up into pretty scary numbers. So we took that as one of our R&D challenges, and we came up with moldless manufacturing method, which sounds really cool, but it's not as accurate as mostly molding manufacturing method, which is what it really is. Uh, Torres wing is the really creative way that M. Torres chooses to name. So the, the process is lay up an inner surface and cure it to a stage B state. Stage B is a partial cure. You've got the resin about 80% of the way till its final cure stage. Uh, resins are a thermoset plastic, so you gotta heat it and pressurize it and, and it undergoes a chemical reaction. So we take it about 80% of the way through the reaction to get it structurally sound, but it's not 100% cured. So new material applied to it will bond to the existing material. You take all of those sections that you've made and you glue them together into something that looks like the final part you want to make, and then you apply more material on the outside of that to cover up all of the seams, and then you take it through a final cure cycle, and now everything in your part is cured into a final flyaway part. But you have yet to actually use one of these major mold systems that I just showed you in the photo. So this is a picture-by-picture -picture, uh, walkthrough of how you would make an airplane fuselage using this method. The first step here uh, is these are the frames of an airplane. So quick uh, jargon, frames are circumferential stiffeners, stringers are longitudinal stiffeners, and skin holds all of that together. So these are the frames. Uh, if you're sitting in an airplane, in between every window is a frame behind the pretty skin on the inside. These would be molded. You drape form this over a surface that looks kind of like that shape. You apply vacuum through the surface to draw the fabric down, and you take it to that 80% cure. You take those two and load it into another smaller mold, and you wrap some more material around it. You take it through another 80% cure. Now that's all one piece. Structurally sound enough that I could jump up and down on it without distorting it, but not fully cured. Then you take some of those pieces and you start gluing them together into something that starts to look like an airplane. Uh, you can apply aircraft grade epoxy through that. Then you apply material around the seams of those joints. You still have not achieved the outer surface of the airplane. You have all of these dents in it, which are for the longitudinal stiffeners, the stringers. Now you want those to stay there, so you apply one more layer of material across everything, so you now have one consistent piece, but you've got to fill those void so that the next layer of material doesn't fall down into those gaps. Then you put on what is ultimately the outer surface of your airplane part, and now you can cure the whole thing in an autoclave. And if you want, you can remove that material that you use to fill the voids. There are reasons to leave it in there. Uh, any material that can survive an autoclave would provide both thermal and acoustic insulation to your part. Uh, you can also put radio shielding in or anything else you want, depending on the application of your vehicle. <coughs> Uh, booster rockets if it's a space thing. 
And then you can take those larger assemblies and start gluing them together in an airplane. Uh, this is the test system we built in Spain for our system. We, the robot is one of the more typical products we supply to industry. Uh, we built all the rest of that as a test rig to demonstrate this theory. That robot is pressing against the part with about 400 pounds of force. There's nothing inside it reacting that force except the part itself, but we still were able to hold tolerances of plus or minus five thousandths of an inch. After it was fully cured, we put it in another one of our systems, which is used to trim out all of those holes. And now you have an aircraft fuselage that was assembled nose to tail in a single piece with all of the structural reinforcing elements and zero fasteners. What that translates to is an aircraft fuselage that's about 30% lighter than normal and was built in about 30% less time. Both of those are big cost savings for the OEM, which translates to cost savings for the buyer. There's our team that put it together uh, and the flashy paint job we put on it. This is now a conference room that we ship around to uh, trade shows around the world. It makes for a really interesting prop. Uh, it's also, when it's not on the road, it is the chairman's office in our factory. So it's a pretty fun thing to have out on the factory floor. He loves it. Uh, and then just to kind of walk you through how this looks in operation, we've got a quick video here, which we'll see whether or not this plays. Here we go. So going through the first stage is the elementary component manufacturing. Uh, so this is the mold. We didn't do in the test demo, we didn't do the longitudinal stiffener element of it because we wanted the geometry to be really simple. So manually apply the material to the mold. Uh, and this is also what's called a dry fiber process. So you're going to see here in a minute a bag gets wrapped around, goo comes in. That's the thermoplastic, or excuse me, thermoset resin coming in. We used our really fancy oven to cook it on the shop floor. That's structurally sound. Now I can jump up and down on it. Uh, well, then we made a whole bunch of those things, and we took those components and we assembled them into something that looks like an airplane. So this is still orders of magnitude less tooling that's involved in a traditional aerospace assembly process. Uh, the nice part about this is if you make any changes to the design, you only have to change that one small section of the mold, that one ring. You don't have to take the entire mold off the assembly line and modify it. It also allows you to make multiple products go down the same assembly line, because you could swap out a couple of rings from one variant to the next, and you're off to making your air next vehicle. Then we put it into uh, our fiber placement cell. That's just a plate joint at either end. Like I said, there's nothing inside that reinforcing the part. We're just adding more material onto the outside of it. And again, this is a dry fiber material. It's just the carbon fibers themselves. There's no resin impregnated onto them. So after we finished applying all of the material on the outside of this, uh, not in a collaborative way, we're going to take this whole thing and we're going to move it to the uh, next assembly stage, which we'll see in a moment once we get rid of our fancy lasers. So we bag it. We're going to infuse this whole process again. Uh, and the way this process works is you evacuate the bag onto the part, so that becomes the compression force on the outside to make sure the resin flows through uniformly. Uh, you inject the resin at various points around the circumference of the body. As it fills, you want to keep advancing where the injection point is so that the flow is uniform. And once you've infused the entire part, uh, that process took about an hour, uh, then we carry it off to an even fancier oven and cook it. Uh, that oven has a substantially lower operating cost than an autoclave, though, so again, that's why we went with the dry fiber process. Uh, then we just trim out the components that we don't want after uh, we have fully cured the part. And when you finish that process, you're left with a single component fuselage uh, that looks like that. And then we gave it a flashy paint job and uh, it carried on, it could continue on through manufacturing if you wish, but this was as far as we took it for the demonstration. Uh, yeah, it's not a lot to say, it's painting, it's manual, it's not a lot of fun. Uh, and there's our conference room. So, there we go. Advantages of this process over what they do today. It's a lot more automated, which means you can speed it up and you get a lot more consistent result out of what you're doing. Uh, 
the manual process that operates today works great. They make a lot of airplanes using that process, but they have to continuously check along the assembly line. Every single stage of manufacturing has a quality check, which has to be certified. Uh, and that just slows the process down and adds cost. We eliminated all the fasteners and clips inside the structure, 30% cost savings, 30% time savings. Uh, there's much less assembly tooling involved in this. So there's a huge cost savings in terms of infrastructure which means you can introduce products to market much more quickly. You don't have the, what is currently about a three-year runway of making that factory before you can start producing your first article out of it. Uh, if you really start diving down into the weeds of the part itself, you get a lot more structural continuity in your carbon fiber part. You have one continuous part. You don't have seams, you don't have joints, you don't have points of mechanical failure built into your structure. It's all cured together. Uh, and you have a lot of uh, more flexibility in your manufacturing because you can introduce material into those joints that get cured and co-bonded into your structure that you can't do under a current manual manufacturing process. So that's our spiel.